Welcome back to Patrick's Review. In this episode, A Nightmare on Elm Street, the 2010 remake. Hi there, welcome back to Patrick's Review. I'm your host, Milo Sipka. Sorry if this review is a little dark. The light around here is not that great. <laughs> and it's the only place I could get with the best reception. And join me as I take you on a ride through the wild world of science fiction action and horror, or from my personal DVD collection. Now, in this episode, we look at the film A Nightmare on Elm Street, the 2010 Samuel Bayer remake. From Platinum Dunes, basically Michael Bay's uh, production of the of this remake. Now, now the DVD actually in Region Four in Australia comes from Warner Home Video. Now, as for the story, a group of teenagers in the Elm Street suburb of Springwood find themselves under assault by a mysterious figure in their dreams, who wears a dirty red and green sweater and a fedora hat, and uses a glove with blades fitted in the fingers. When one of their number is killed by the figure. Remaining friends realize that they all attended the same preschool in their youth, and the figure was originally the janitor who was accused of molesting them, and burned alive by the eventual parents, who then managed to suppress the children's memories. Believing that the figure, named Freddy Krueger, was somehow innocent of the crimes and is attacking them as revenge, their surviving friends attempt to solve the crime and find a way to overcome Krueger's assault. Now, it is always a dicey proposition to remake a film, even more so when the original film is an esteemed classic of its genre. In particular, the 1984 horror classic A Nightmare on Elm Street, a low-budget horror film that ended up creating the horror movie icon of the red and green, green sweater-wearing and fedora hat-wearing child killer Freddy Krueger, who wears a razor glove and attacks his victims in their dreams, cracking jerks and one-liners as he dispatches each victim in various inventive ways that, for the most part, featured some cracking good visual effects, as far as 1980s practical effects were capable of. The film ended up being a surprise hit, and earned its place as a top horror franchise, franchise in the 1980s, even though most of the sequels weren't exactly good enough to outgun the original live acting or plot. Even though I'm a fan of the original film, I was never that much infused or sympathetic towards the character Freddy Krueger. He is a pretty badass figure and has a personality to make horror fans fall in love with the character, but as someone who has almost no patience for characters or real world people who harm children, I didn't really like his background so much. But in terms of nastiness, he's nothing, compared to the version that pops up, pops up in this police stage remake. The 20, this 2010 remake was a controversial film to say the least. When it came out, and yes I did see this one during its theatrical run, fans were either divided between those who loved the remake and those who absolutely hated it, and were scathing of producer Michael Bay and its Platinum Dunes company's track record of putting out mediocre remakes of classic genre material in order to make an easy profit by milking fans for nostalgia for all it was worth. I've yet to watch their 2003 remake of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but we'll do so in the not too distant future. But I've seen the 2009 remake of Friday the 13th, which was handled pre pre pretty poorly, although not as exactly as bad as this remake of Nightmare on Street has done. A cursory glance through the user comments section of the IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes websites shows the polarized opinion of those who either loved the film or hated it, out hated it outright. Somewhere in the middle of the road, of those are quite uncommon. For me, this 2010 remake of Nightmare on Elm Street was very, very disappointing in many respects, but surprisingly good at others. For the record, even though he's not Robert England, Jackie Earl Haley made an impressive Freddy Krueger. Even though his CGI-enhanced Burns makeup, it resembled something you would get if you invite one of those Navi aliens from Avatar to your neighborhood barbecue, and the Navi mistakes you grill for a fire spirit and tries to worship it, only to get too close and scorch its face off in the process and a voice that sounds too close to Christian Bale in full Batman mode while suffering the advanced stages of lung cancer. The production values here are very high, resulting in a very slick looking movie. Michael Bay has his faults, but it certainly doesn't scrimp on the budget. Those two things are the only two things that prevent me from giving this film a D-, because without them, this film is certainly one of the most unnecessary and just plain awful remakes I've had the misfortune watching projected on the cinema screen. The faults in this movie are astounding. First off, while many non-horror fans will hate the fact that the original Freddy Krueger was a child killer, everybody, both horror fans and non-horror viewers, will hate the fact that the writers Eric Heisserer and Wesley Strick decided to turn the character into a pedophile. While I do have to acknowledge that Wes Craven's original intention was to make Freddy Krueger a child molester when he was writing the script for his 1984 classic all the way back then, but realized that it would result in box office poison and decided to change it to sim simply being a child killer, it's still a very bad move to have one of the most recognizable horror film villains in movie history become something that is considered in today's society virtually untouchable. It also presents the filmmakers a whole new set of problems in the writing stage. In real life, 
anybody who has been molested as a child never forgets the experience, no, ma- no matter how young they were when it happened to them. It's not something you easily forget. So how in the frigging heck did the parents here manage to suppress their memories so effectively? Also, it seems a touch cruel to split up the preschool students' friendships just to keep them from remembering their pasts. These parents have done some pretty stupid things to their children. Next up on the problems front are the micronaps. The invention of the, an invention of the writers that has very little basis in reality, they were put in simply to allow the monster to attack his victims whenever he liked. This also kills the basic concept of the whole story to the point that the rules have been seriously messed with, resulting in a film that has no concept of keeping to its own rules. The original film also broke its own rules, particularly in the atrocious ending it had to invoke sequels with, something I'll explain when I cover that movie, and thus destroying the internal logic considerably. The casting is also a problem here. Aside from Haley, who as I said makes an impressive Kruger, the actors playing the teenagers here, some of them were my age when I watched this the theatrically and I was 25 at the time, were not very convincing in their roles, and also seemed to be seriously going for the emo crowd instead of being normal teens that populated the original film. Rooney Mara, who played this film's version Nancy, was reputed to have since hated the film and the performance in it, but thought she has gone on to better things since. That being said, this remake did prove a few successful financially, even for half the critics hated it, making more money than the majority of the original Nightmare on the Street franchise. The film, knowing it isn't very scary in the story, starts to pile on the irritating jump scares trend that ruins so many other film projects during this period, but for the ending, this one did make quite a few people jump in their seats despite being rather unnecessary. The last film item on my checklist would have to be the effects. When a remake with 2000s era CGI technology gets outgunned by a 1984 original, which used almost entirely practical effects, except for the part where the original Freddy Krueger walks through a jailhouse door, which was achieved by trick photography, a very old type of effect. You have to wonder why they even tried to do it in the first place. And by that I mean reworking the original effects of CGI here. I hate the majority of CGI effects. I grew up on practical effects and those things look realistic enough, no matter how cheap the effects looked. At least, uh, at least they were there, unlike the CGI crap of today when, that when they do appear, you know precisely that they were cooked up on somebody's computer. And the decision to replicate the opening se- the credits twice was a very poor one. Even for director Samuel Bain, Bayer is known as the king of 1990s music videos, given he's worked on so many classic ones in that decade. He doesn't quite have the stylistic or technical resources to make this film any good. The only things that prevent me from giving this otherwise very poor remake to D minus rating are the surprisingly impressive performance from Jackie Earl Haley's Freddy Krueger, despite his look, and the rather slick look of the film, but that's it. This film gets a D plus, 3 out of 10, makes it about the level of being mediocre. Now, the, now there's some gore, but not as effective as those in the original film. There's no nudity here either. The original film had some nudity, but I was pretty coy about it. As for the DVD, this was released onto DVD in Region 4 by Warner Home Video. They had bought out New Line Cinema a couple of years before, when New Line ended up losing almost the entire financial clout, after the failure of the atheist fantasy The Golden Compass ruined them completely. And the DVD here is playing second field to the Blu-ray release, which had a whole heap of extras, while this DVD only has one feature to go with. I do have a complaint to film companies about this. Not everyone likes Blu-rays, and still prefer DVDs because they're much easier to work with, and you don't need to upgrade your player's firmware every time the Blu-ray discs get new features. I really hate Blu-rays, although I do have a small stock of them, but only in films I can't get the DVD versions of, that's why I have them, and this attitude of screw the DVD fans by only putting the bare minimum supplements on them is really pissing me off. Anyway, in this case, the DVD presentation on Nightmare on the Street 2010 is excellent on the technical front, and there's no complaints about picture or sound quality, other than the film being a little too dark to see the entire, entirety of Kruger's face, but I guess I can fix that by simply boosting contrast on my TV. One thing about these new DVDs that never fails to amuse me is the inclusion of the audio descriptive service feature, which is basically a voiceover that describes every single freaking thing on the picture for those who are blind. Somehow I don't think that blind people will be in the position to be seen now watching DVDs, so this feature is just plain stupid. Of course it's pretty funny listening to one of these tracks, and in that, that case this is a plus. The sole feature on this disc is only about the reinvention of the Freddy Krueger character for the remake, but that's fine for now. The only subtitles on the disc are in English. Now that's it for this uh, episode where we review Nightmare on the Street 2010. Now, I don't do review, I mean, I don't do requests, but if you want to know if I have a certain film in my collection, just hit me up on the comments page. I hope you guys are staying safe, and that's it for this review.